We have been ready to get our children's ministry starting on Sunday mornings again for a while, and um, we were waiting till the Lord would bring the servants to be able to, to help us back there, and uh, the Lord is blessing that ministry tremendously. If you haven't seen that ministry on Wednesday nights in particular, you can't hardly see it on Sunday mornings because you're here to receive the ministry of the Word, but if you haven't, uh, you can poke your head in on Wednesday night and just see what the Lord is doing in that. Revelation chapter 12, before we invite our new members uh, this morning, we have been continuing along in this very important book, Revelation chapter 12, and we are going to be in verses uh, 7 through 12 this morning. Follow along with me, please, as we read together, Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 7. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there were, was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser... Of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses him before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea! 
because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he is only a short time. As you remember from last week, Revelation chapter 12 is an important chapter as we progress through this wonderful book in Revelation. It is immediately after the interlude of Revelation chapter 11, which is a picture of something else that is occurring, synonymous with the chapters that we are going to be learning about as we progress through the remainder of the book of Revelation, the, the, the ministry of these two witnesses. And in Revelation chapter 12, as we are introduced to this section, it reminds us that we are indeed in a great spiritual war. It is important to remember that we are in a great spiritual war because the only weapon that we've been given to assault the enemy is with the very word of God. We fight with the sword of truth, and we need to be familiar with the truth. We need to be contenders earnestly for the faith that we profess. We need to know the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and proclaim it well. This world has been at war against the truth since Satan's rebellion and since he has been the ruler of this age. And now what we are going to be seeing in this chapter in particular, in the chapters that follow, chapters 12 through 14, is the account of the tribulation from the viewpoint of Satan. Just as in chapters 6 through 11, we looked at the tribulation from the standpoint of heaven. That's essentially what we've been doing. Now we see fit from the standpoint of Satan, the work that God is doing in the world. We see this supernatural war against God. And it comes to a climactic point in world history. For millennia, Satan has been waging war against God and against his people, obviously masquerading himself as an angel of light, masterfully doing so, deceiving the nations, masterful liar, deceiving the peoples of the earth into a false hope through their philosophies, through their psychologies, through humanistic morality, through false theology, false gospels, false prophets, false teachers, false pastors, false shepherds. And the Apostle Paul expressed great concern even for the church in Corinth, lest we think we are immune. The church in Corinth who thought themselves so wise and biblically astute, you remember that. That is even the nature of what I've been investigating during my doctoral research work, the nature of the Corinthian deception and how that led to them to wholly unbiblical philosophies of ministry as they ultimately tore down the flock of God. Their knowledge, as you know, did not produce maturity in them. Their knowledge, rather, puffed them up, puffed them up with pride. And because they were so sure of their own knowledge, they stopped pursuing understanding. They stopped pursuing love. Instead, they became judge and jury of one another, and they became accusers of one another. And consequently, they sowed division and in the end nearly destroyed one another. In short, they had knowledge of the word, but they had no wisdom. Wisdom is the application of truth. They had no wisdom, though they had knowledge of the word. And it fits in that context that they themselves became vulnerable to false teaching, false teaching about Christ or false teaching about the Spirit of God or false teachings about the gospel. And, and listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. This was the true church. And yet, the enemy, Satan, 
The one who will be overthrown is so mischievous and so deceptive and so malicious as a liar, he would even lead many in the church astray. And it is also an important reminder for us in that Satan is at work amidst churches. In chapter 11, verse 14, it says, disguising himself as an angel of light. And then verse 15. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. That has led to innumerable false conversions and innumerable false professions, as well as innumerable false churches. In addition, to the thousands upon thousands of churches over the last 2,000 years whose lampstands have been removed. And the deception and worldly wisdom has even had a great impact on the people of God as well, crippling many in a perpetual state of immaturity, though they think themselves wise and think themselves mighty according to the flesh, all apart of Satan's battle plan to eliminate all those who serve God. Where he can't, he acts as the accuser of the brethren and draws on the brethren to become accusers of one another in order that he can continually harangue God about the unworthiness and hypocrisy of believers to receive his mercy. And you can be sure that if it were up to you, Satan would be successful. Except that Christ has promised that of those that truly belong to him, John chapter 10, 28 and 29, no one can snatch them out of his Father's hand. Still, that is not to say that Satan can't sift you like wheat, is it? Inhibit your work or even bewitch you as you did to those in the church of Galatia. Deceive you with false doctrines. As a powerful ruler of this world, Jesus said repeatedly in John 12, 14, and chapter 16. And Ephesians 2, 2 says he is a great prince of the power of the air. You need to understand that Satan has it within the fullness of his power to destroy all those who serve God and discourage you so greatly that you would lose your faith. If not for the fact that there is one greater than he. First John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's been proven in history as we looked at Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 to 6 last week as God was successful to bring the promised child despite all the devil's plans to destroy the woman and her offspring. Now, it's October and my brother Dan, whom you know, sent us a picture yesterday of he and his wife already decorating for Christmas. Well, true to the family clan, we had our Christmas message last week in October as we looked at the birth of this promised child. So I beat him to it. We also have a competitive family. As the Lord would have it, we are looking at that wonderful passage in which our Father proves himself faithful. The Son comes at a predetermined time, and he was then caught up into heaven, securing victory and new life for all of those who put their faith in him. Through his death, he rendered powerless him who has the power of death, that is the devil, Hebrews writes. But even so, 
Satan's sentence hasn't been carried out, and he continues to do his destructive work until Christ's final triumph over him. That'll come in Revelation chapter 19. In the meantime, he'll keep fighting this losing war out of spite, out of hate, just as Nazi Germany continued war in Europe after the Allies breached the Atlantic Wall in Normandy on June 6, 1944. Even at that point, many of Germany's high command called for peace talks, called for surrender, knowing that the Allies' victory in Europe was inevitable from that point, and continuing the war effort would only result in more loss of life, but it would do nothing for the nation of Germany. They recognized that they were fighting merely for the sake of spite, and so it is with Satan. It's not a rational war. Christ has already secured the victory, but this red dragon will continue to relentlessly fight this losing war against God until he is thrown into hell for a thousand years before he is released for one final time to deceive the nations and fight one final battle. And then he will be locked up and thrown into the lake of fire forever. The hottest, deepest cell. And so, verses 7 to 12 describes this scene, a scene of war. And we get a picture of this war of the ages, this war to end all wars. And the first thing that we see is Satan's losses in heaven. That's verses 7 to 8. First, take notice of who's fighting in heaven. I think it's helpful for us to, to remember this because it's not even the, the glorified saints that are in heaven going into combat against Satan. Contrary to what many believers believe, they believe it is our work to rebuke Satan, to fight against Satan. And nowhere in scriptures, in the scriptures are we encouraged or commanded to do that. Satan is a powerful enemy, and we have never been commanded to fight against Satan. We're told to flee from him. And in verses 7 to 8, it's Michael and his angels that are fighting against the dragon. It is not even the redeemed, the house of God in heaven, fighting against Satan and his legions. It's Michael and his angels. Michael is one of two of the archangels mentioned in the scriptures. Obviously, the other one we know very well as Gabriel. And as Gabriel is presented in scriptures, he's primarily depicted to us, in fact, he's always depicted to us as one who is a messenger. He is a messenger. And Michael is the other archangel, and Gabriel and Michael are the only two named archangels in Scripture, which means that they rule over the other angels. They rule over the other angels even as Lucifer rules over his angels, demons. But Gabriel and Michael have different responsibilities. Gabriel's responsibility is chiefly to proclaim, announce, and obviously most notably, announce the coming of the Messiah, the Messiah's birth, back in Revelation 12.5. Michael, though, Michael's responsibility is depicted in the Scriptures as a warrior, Michael fights, he rescues. Every time he's presented to us in the scriptures, he's rescuing God's people from the devil. You remember, for instance, how God's servant Daniel was given the ability to interpret dreams. But there was one dream that Daniel couldn't understand, and so Daniel prays. God answers that prayer. And he sends an angel to tell Daniel the meaning of that prayer. And maybe you remember what happens. The angel comes into conflict with a great and powerful demon, demon in control of the entire Persian Empire. And he is held up. And that happens for three weeks. God responds to Daniel's prayer immediately. 
the very day he sends this angelic messenger to reveal to Daniel the nature of this prayer. And Daniel is left hanging. He doesn't understand why the Lord does not answer this prayer. And this angel eventually reveals to Daniel this supernatural spiritual battle that was occurring between him and this great demon in control of the Persian Empire. And he could not have victory until Michael comes, who he calls one of the chief princes. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. And then, and only then, the angel prevailed. It speaks to Michael's own strength. He's a powerful and strong angel. And in fact, that angelic messenger originally sent to Daniel tells Daniel in Daniel chapter 10, verse 21, that no one stands against the forces of the evil one like Michael does of all God's created beings. But that has always been the nature of this war that has been raging in heaven. Since Satan's rebellion, Satan and his demons fight against the supernatural ministers of God to keep them from their work. Just as we read about in Daniel chapter 10. Likewise, do you remember who it was that was sent to rescue Moses' body from Satan? After Moses dies, it was Michael Michael, who was sent to rescue Moses' body from the devil. And we can only imagine what Satan would have wanted with Moses' body, but we might have an idea because of what happens in Revelation chapter 13 when Satan raises the Antichrist in this false resurrection from the dead. However he does it, and we can understand that a false resurrection of Moses' body would have what it would have done to the nation of Israel if he was successful to do that, the kind of idolatry that would about to enter the promised land as Israel would most likely have responded to worship Moses, his allegedly resurrected body. Even as there is a shrine of sorts today in the land of Israel to King David, to which many Jews go, it being elaborately ordained to pray in their false religious system. Or maybe Satan wanted Moses' body for some other evil purpose, we don't know. Either way, Michael is sent in Deuteronomy chapter 34 to fight against Satan, and he won. And then we've also seen Michael at work in Revelation, though we haven't mentioned him by name We saw him working in Revelation chapter 6 and just last week in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. It'll be Michael who protects the Israelites from annihilation during their time of great distress, such that mankind has never seen. But what provokes Satan to such overwhelming rage is interesting, and it's important. Daniel chapter 12 provides us with a parallel account of all that we've been learning so far from the book of Revelation. And verses 1 to 2 of Daniel 12 describes this. It describes the rapture of the church, and that is what provokes the dragon to this rage, resulting in the rise of the Antichrist and the great war in heaven climaxes, And now, Michael and his angels rise up to finally overthrow Satan from heaven. By the way, the original Greek in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, makes it clear that the dragon is the one who initiates that battle. About which Henry Morris writes, With what weapons and by what tactics this heavenly warfare will be waged is beyond our understanding. Angels cannot be injured or slain with earthly weapons. And such physical forces, as we know, are, about, are not able to move spiritual beings. But these beings do operate in a physical universe, so there must exist powerful physico-spiritual energies of which we yet can have only vague intimations. Energies which can propel angel bodies at superluminary velocities through space and 
which can move mountains and change planetary orbits. It is with such energies and powers that this heavenly battle will be waged and the spectators in heaven will watch in awe when Michael finally prevails and Satan is forced forever out of heaven, a tremendous cry of thanksgiving will resound through the heavens. Why? Why such a tremendous cry of thanksgiving? The war isn't over yet. They're merely thrown down to the earth at this point. But this is a major victory because the accuser of the brethren is overthrown. It might even be possible that the rapture of the church provokes this great battle in heaven as Satan wages war in order to prevent all the saints who have died since Acts chapter 2, along with those who are alive at this point when they are raptured in the twinkling of an eye and prevents them, Satan may even well be responding to prevent them from entering heaven's gates. He hears a trumpet blast and responds like an athlete out of the starting blocks to the sound of a gun. Racing against that brief moment of time to prevent God's people from from having a safe passage. His final work to overthrow the church. Satan has been seeking to destroy the church since its very beginning in Acts chapter 2. And so it makes very good sense that he would divert all of his energies in that final moment that he would have to usher this final blow and so deny Christ his bride. This is an all-out supernatural battle, and it ends in a great loss to Satan because he'll never again be the prince of the power of the air. And that's also why he's full of fury, and all that fury is leashed out on the earth. And it seems that that's what unleashes the great tribulation now at this point. This battle rages. We don't know how long the battle lasts, but when he is thrown to the earth... Satan's fury rages, and so it's very likely that this rage is the final three and a half years before Christ's return. This is Satan's battle of the bulge, if you will. In verse 9, though there is great and glorious victory in heaven, this is his final effort. And that's how we should understand verse 9. We should understand verse 9 is God's victory in heaven. There is victory in heaven. But there are three descriptions of Satan here that remind us of who he is. Great dragon because of his power to inflict overwhelming harm against the earth. And he is likewise the serpent of old, the treacherous truth twister. We already noted Satan's work as such in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, but I'm afraid that, Paul writes, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Christ's battle in the church is a battle for your mind. Render that into our, in our anti-intellectual evangelicalism. And the word craftiness there is panurgia. And it means sly, it means cunning trickery. It is, it is the kind of trickery that you are specifically admonished by the Apostle Paul to be on guard against by saturating your minds with the truth of God's Word, by ensuring that you are students of God's Word, regularly sitting under the teaching of God's Word by those who are qualified to proclaim God's Word. 
not tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. It's the same idea. The idea of cunning trickery. And of course, he is also called the devil. He's called the devil because he is a false witness, a false accuser, a maliciously lying witness in the courtroom of God. Satan, the ultimate adversary of God and all that he created good, the dragon who deceives the whole world. And that's quite a series of adjectives to describe this one. And we'll see all those things coming together in this final moment of time, beginning in Revelation chapter 13, culminating at the battle of Armageddon in chapter 19. But great as that battle will be in Satan's final and desperate attack on God, his angels and his people, desperate even though Satan's loss is sure, but akin to Hitler's battle for Berlin, in which he enlists countless children, deceiving them into thinking that they'll be heroes who will have the honor of being the new aristocracy of the Third Reich. It will be in, this sim- in a similar man- manner that Satan himself will deceive the nations. He'll be doomed to fail, just as the battle for Berlin was doomed to fail. The victory has already been secured in the death and resurrection of Christ and it has been reaffirmed in this great battle in heaven and that's why in verses 10 to 12 we have Satan's pronouncement in heaven. The victory has already been secured because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And that gives us confidence in in this pronouncement. A confidence that all those who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins will be atoned for. They'll be cleansed. There's a well-known story of a time when Martin Luther, the great reformer, was translating the Bible into German, which of course was illegal, for which he had a warrant on his head, and he was overwhelmed by discouragement as he attributed the work of Satan buffeting him. The accuser came with a long list of Luther's sins, his many sins, overwhelmed him with despair, mocking Luther for his desire to serve God, and given Luther's prominence in the Reformation itself, I wouldn't say that it was at all unlikely that it wasn't anyone but Satan buffeting him. If there were any that Satan would attack during that time, it would be the men such as Luther, Calvin, Knox, Zwingli. But Luther confessed in his despair, the truth of his sins and maintain that Christ's blood covered them all. As 1 John 1, 7 says, the blood of the Son cleanses us from all sin. And so he threw his ink pot at Satan, staining the wall with ink, and you can still see that to this day. And that is the testimony of all true believers and why we all hold to the gospel so dearly, even to the point of death. But look at this. Look at this. Reading verses 11 to 12. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. They did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell on them. Woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has come down to you having great wrath knowing that he has only a short time. But moving back to verse 10, 
the beginning of this pronouncement, we hear this loud voice saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. Notice how that is in the past tense. What does that mean? What's a past tense verb? A past tense verb is an action that happened in the past, right? That's relatively simple. Let me ask you, has this happened in the past or is it yet to come in the future? It's yet to come in the future. The total victory over Satan is that secure that it's spoken of here as already done. Where else do we see that? There is another passage of Scripture that very clearly outlines exactly the nature of this war. Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2, we see the exact same thing. Listen to verses 4 to 6. He who sits in the heavens laughs. I know you already know this, but that is the only place in Scripture where God is ever said to laugh. And it is in the context of the nation's rebellion. Because it is so foolish and his victory so secure. The Lord, verse 4, scoffs at them. And then look, verse 5, or listen if you're not turned there, but verse 5, then he will, future tense verb, makes sense because it hasn't happened yet, right? He will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, Verse 6, but as for me, I have installed. Future or past tense verb? It's past tense. I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Same thing we see in Revelation chapter a victory so secure that it can be spoken of in the future as a future event as though it were in the past because it is so absolute. Just as Martin Luther wrote in that great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, the Prince of Darkness Grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. Let us likewise be confident in the work of the Lord. As Tom comes to lead us in our final song this morning before we invite our new members to join our church together. But let's pray. Precious Father, Lord, we are so grateful for the time that you have given to us in your word. We thank you for the encouragement that we've had already and the baptisms that we were able to witness this morning. We thank you for the work of saving grace, the victory that you have given to Joel, Rebecca, and Sue. And Lord, may us let us be a great encouragement to them as well as we proclaim your perfect and accomplished work in the death of our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, the security of the hope that we have because of his resurrection. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen.